Hello and welcome back to this course, covering the exam topics for the JNCIS ENT certification. In this section of the course, we're reviewing ISIS concepts, configurations, and monitoring in Junos. In this lesson, we'll be doing a lab demonstration covering the configuration, monitoring, and troubleshooting of multi-area ISIS. We'll configure a router to participate in ISIS as an L1 slash L2 router, review the adjacencies, interface participation, and ISIS database. We'll also see how an ISIS speaking router will generate its own default route towards a level two attached router. Finally, we'll force a common configuration mistake and see how to identify it using trace options log messages. Just like the other lab demonstration lessons, we'll be reviewing the end diagram first, then the lab instructions, and finally jump into the command line to get our hands dirty. So, let's jump on in and review the target diagram for this demonstration. In this lab topology, we have three routers, VSRX1, VSRX2, and VSRX3. The shaded ovals here represent ISIS areas. The green shaded area on the left is ISIS area 51, and the purple shaded area on the right is ISIS area 52. VSRX3 is configured with two virtual router routing instances, with a separate ISIS process running in each routing instance. Area 51 connects VSRX3 to VSRX1, and Area 52 connects VSRX3 to VSRX2. The routing instances on VSRX3 are configured as level 1 only routers and will not form a level 2 adjacency with VSRX1 or 2. In this demonstration, VSRX2 and 3 are already configured according to this diagram. So, we'll be focusing on configuring and monitoring ISIS on VSRX1. VSRX1 has interface configuration already and management access, though no ISIS configuration is currently present on VSRX1. So, we'll be seeing how we can insert this router into the network as an L1 slash L2 router in Area 51. Let's now review the instructions for this lab before we jump into the demonstration. First, we'll configure and monitor ISIS on VSRX1. We'll start off by reviewing the starting configuration on each of the three devices in our topology. We'll take a brief look at the routing table on VSRX3 so we can better understand how it changes after we configure VSRX1. Next, since VSRX1 has no ISIS configuration currently, we'll set the loopback interface's NET address and configure the ISO protocol family on GE001, 2, and 4. We'll then configure GE001 and 2 and the loopback interface to participate in ISIS, setting some specific configuration according to the information here. We'll commit this configuration and review the commands and outputs used to monitor the current adjacencies, interface, and database status. Finally, we'll review the routing table on VSRX3 once more to see how things have changed, ensuring VSRX3 has generated its own default route towards VSRX1. And that'll wrap up our configuration and monitoring of ISIS section. Then, we'll move on to the troubleshooting of ISIS. First, we'll configure trace options so we can get some detailed log messages about the errors we'll be creating. The error we'll configure is to have mismatched area configuration between level 1 neighbors, where VSRX3's VR11 instance was previously in Area 51, we'll reconfigure this to be in Area 53. And, once committed, we'll take a look at the trace options log file to see the error log messages that are generated. And that'll be it. 
let's jump on into the devices and get started. First, we'll review the starting configuration on VSRX1. As per usual, we have pretty minimal configuration, the lab user, and some default configuration. Moving down, we have our interface configurations, with the management interface, GE000, and the other production interfaces below, configured with IPs according to the diagram. Then, at the bottom, we have the loopback interface configured, a static route for management access, and we've placed the VSRX into packet mode instead of flow mode. Now, let's jump over to VSRX2 and review the starting configuration there. At the top here, we also have the lab user and other default configuration present. Moving down to the interfaces, we also have the management interface, GE000, and the other production interfaces below. All configured with IPs according to the diagram. On VSRX2, however, all of the non-management interfaces, GE001, 2, and 4, have the ISO protocol family enabled. The loopback interface is configured, with the ISO protocol family and an NET address configured in Area 52. Moving down, we see the static route for management and then our ISIS configuration on VSRX2. We see that the loopback interface is set as a passive interface. When an interface is configured as a passive interface, it will not originate ISIS hello packets. However, the directly attached route will be advertised into ISIS. We also see that GE004 has been configured to only allow level 1 adjacency formation, so it will not originate level 2 IIH PDUs. GE001 and 2, however, are configured in the reverse manner, so they will only originate level 2 PDUs. Finally, let's check out the configuration on VSRX3 before we get started with the configuration on 1. Now, the beginning of the configuration on VSRX3 is just like the other two devices. We have the lab user configured and other default configuration present. Moving down, we also have the interface configurations, with the management interface and production interfaces below, with the ISO protocol family enabled. You'll notice that the loopback interface has two logical units configured, one for each of the virtual router routing instances configured. Each is configured in a different ISIS area via the NET address. Moving further down, we see the management access static route at the top and packet mode configuration. Then we have our routing instances configuration with the VR11 instance and VR12 instance. In each instance, we have one of the gigabit ethernet interfaces and one of the loopback interfaces. Each routing instance also has ISIS configuration present, with VR11, a router participating in Area 51, and VR12 is a router participating in Area 52. We see that Level 2 has been disabled on each interface, making each of these virtual router instances a Level 1 router. Let's now take a brief look at the routing table on VSRX3. We see that we have our three instances of the inet.0 table present, one each for the default instance, the VR11 instance, and the VR12 instance. We see that VR11 does not have any ISIS learned routes present. This is expected since our VR11 connects to VSRX1, which is not yet configured to participate in ISIS. In VR12, however, we see a single ISIS learned route, the loopback interface of VSRX2. We do not see a default route, since although VSRX2 is capable of forming level 2 adjacencies, it has not yet formed a level 2 adjacency, and is therefore not yet level 2 attached. Great. Let's move back over to VSRX1 and proceed with our configuration. 
The ISISNET address is assigned to the loopback interface, which defines the area that the node is a member of. NET addresses are 10 bytes long and written in hexadecimal, just like MAC addresses. They're written in this format with the first two characters and last two characters always being set to 49 and 00, respectively. These addresses consist of two parts. The area ID, that's the first six hexadecimal characters, and the system ID, the remaining characters. We've configured VSRX1 in area 51 here. Next, we'll need to enable the ISO protocol family on the logical interfaces that we wish to transmit and receive ISIS messages on. Now, we'll move on to configuring the ISIS protocol. First, we'll enable ISIS on the loopback interface. Though, since the loopback can't form any adjacencies, we'll set it as a passive interface, so IIH PDUs will not be originated from it. We expect that the links between VSRX1 and 2 will always be level 2 adjacencies, so we'll disable level 1 on these interfaces. And similarly, we'll disable level 2 on the interface connecting to VSRX3, since it is expected to only have a level 1 adjacency. Excellent. This looks good. We have the ISO protocol family enabled on each interface and the correct levels disabled on each interface in the ISIS configuration. Let's commit this and take a look at how we can monitor the status of our ISIS instance. Now, in reality, I waited about 40 seconds between the commit completed and the time I entered the command to view the ISIS adjacencies. We see here that we still caught one of the adjacencies before it finished completely forming, as it's in the new state. From the left, we see the interface that each adjacency is formed over. Then we have the host name of the adjacent system. Notice that we've formed two adjacencies with VSRX2 over GE001.0 and GE002.0, and the adjacency with VSRX3 over the expected interface GE004.0. Next right is the L column, which shows the level of the adjacency. The adjacencies with VSRX2 are level 2, since they are between areas and the adjacency with VSRX3 is a level 1 adjacency. Next, we see the state of the adjacency and the hold time in seconds. Finally, the far right column shows the SNPA address of the adjacent router's interface, the subnetwork point of attachment. This is identical to the interface MAC address of the remote interface though it is written in a compressed fashion, with all preceding zeros in each byte group removed. Let's see now how to review the local router's ISIS interface status. Here, we see the four interfaces on VSRX1 participating in ISIS. From the left, we see the interface name and the level of the interfaces participating in. If the interface were able to form level 1 and level 2 adjacencies, this number would be a 3. Next, are the circuit ID and the level 1 and level 2 DRs elected for the segment? Notice the DR column indicates if the level is disabled for the interface or if the interface is configured to be passive. The last column on the right, we see the level 1 and level 2 metric assigned to this interface. Finally, let's review the contents of the ISIS link state database on VSRX1. The link state database is broken up into two sections. We have the level 1 LSPs and the level 2 LSPs. Much of this information is only useful for verifying you are seeing an LSP from a router, though it does not give any information on the contents of the LSPs outside of showing one with the attached bit set. 
Now that we have ISIS up on VSRX1, let's head back to VSRX3 and see how the route table has changed. We see here that both of the routing instances have a default route that is 42 seconds old. This is because the level 2 adjacency between VSRX1 and 2 is now up. So, both routers will set the attached bit. This will cause the other level 1 adjacent routers to generate their own default route towards the router with the attached bit set. Although the level 1 adjacency between VSRX2 and 3 was up for some time before this demonstration, the attached bit was only set when the level 2 adjacency between VSRX1 and 2 came up, causing the VR12 instance to have a default route generated. Excellent. Let's move on to the next section of the lab to troubleshoot a common ISIS configuration error. First, we'll go ahead and enable trace options on the ISIS protocol. We'll trace messages with the error flag and commit this before we head over to VSRX3 to force a configuration error. We're setting VSRX3 to be in the wrong area. Where it was configured in Area 51 previously, we've changed the loopback NET address to put VSRX3 into Area 53. Since the Level 2 PDUs have been disabled on the link between VSRX1 and 3, we should expect to see the adjacency go down and to receive some log messages indicating the area mismatch. And there we have it. We see error log messages showing that the IIH PDU received from VSRX3 has no matching areas on VSRX1. This concludes the ISIS lab demonstration. I appreciate you sticking with me to configure multi-area ISIS and review how to monitor and troubleshoot ISIS. I hope that this lesson has been informative for you, and I would like to thank you for viewing.